create with Fran Sydney. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. This is Franz Sidney, so welcome to Create with Franz. And today we have a really interesting topic, which I don't think I've ever mentioned in the show before in four years. So it was just about time to delve into what we can call internalized racism. So race is something that can be a problem if we think it's a problem, meaning Is that idea that we are different from other people stopping us from reaching our full potential? We're going to see the symptoms, the strategies, how to get out of that and really create the life that you deserve by talking to a very specialized person here. And her name is Sandra Kushner. So welcome to the show, Sandra. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this. It's something that I'm really passionate about, and hopefully this can be helpful to anyone that might be experiencing this, either consciously or unconsciously. Yes, we know that, uh, well, I know, but you guys will know in a minute that Sandra is actually the founder of Meridian Counseling, so she's a licensed marriage and family therapist in Los Angeles in the US, in case you don't know. And then she's very, very good in talking about what happens inside here. So outside everything is good, but inside there is a big tempest. And so I wanted to really start with with the symptoms. What happens when you have this internalized racism? Yes, so I want to talk a little bit about internalized racism, and I'm going to share a little bit about my own experience with understanding, especially after October 7th and the terrorist attacks that happened in Israel, my own internalized anti-Semitism as a Jewish woman, as a first generation woman whose parents immigrated to America from Ukraine. And so for me, October 7th was a very like pivotal moment in understanding how this plays out in myself and in my relationships and in other traumas that I've experienced. And it was sort of an eye-opening moment of how these things compound for people that come from marginalized groups or who have generational trauma in their family system or because of their race or culture. So the symptoms that I experienced for me after October 7th, um, I always felt that being Jewish was a privilege in a lot of ways because Me as a Jewish woman, especially after I moved to Los Angeles, I felt like I got so many opportunities and kind of got to progress my career in really amazing ways through the Jewish community. So I never really experienced anti-Semitism overtly until October 7th happened. And my parents are actually immigrants from the USSR. They came to America in 1991 when the USSR collapsed and they immigrated to Salt Lake City, Utah as refugees through um, Jewish family services. And, you know, they acculturated, they Americanized. And I really grew up in um, a very sheltered environment. There weren't a lot of Jewish people in Utah at that time. There still are not very many. And um, my parents would always bring up anti-Semitism and their experience of being discriminated against for being Jewish, um, both in Ukraine and in their experience when they moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, and had this different religious background than most of the people there. And for me, I never really experienced that because I was born in America. I did not immigrate. I felt like I had community in Salt Lake City. I was able to really make friends. Um, But I always did have this feeling of like embarrassment of who my family was and our cultural background and where we came from. And this deep awareness that we were very different, but I never attributed it to internalized anti-Semitism. So I want to backtrack a little bit and kind of give a clearer definition because we have talked a lot in the last few years since George Floyd and obviously October 7th happening about racism and overt racism and how, you know, minority groups and people from different backgrounds, different races experience discrimination in this world. But not a lot of people have defined what internalized anti-Semitism or internalized racism means. And so what that actually is, is it's an internal experience 
of disliking or disowning parts of yourself based on your cultural or racial background. So for me, it now in hindsight, right? I was always embarrassed of my family for being who they are because they were different, especially in the environment that I grew up with, which was everyone was LDS and more white presenting than my parents were. And I was so embarrassed of them that I really distanced myself from my cultural background as a child, right? Like I really tried to lean into being Americanized. I started dressing and acting more like the kids around me. I didn't really want my parents to dress a certain way when they came to parent teacher conferences. And it was this feeling of shame and embarrassment of my family for just being who they are that I experienced as an, as a child because I felt like who they are was so different that I would be ostracized or left out or judged. And when you go through this, right, over a lifetime, throughout your childhood, throughout your adolescence, that becomes internalized as like, oh, I don't fit in. I am different than the people around me. There is something inherently wrong with me. And since humans have an inherent need for belonging and community, this can be really traumatic to your sense of self, right? Because it feels like in order to be accepted and loved and wanted, that you have to conform to the people around you. And if you're different, that there's something wrong with you deep, deep down. So I carried all of this, but I didn't have awareness or vocabulary to define it until October 7th happened. And that was kind of this like awakening for me in a lot of ways of all these things that I had like suppressed and all this shame and all this um, stuff that I had been carrying around being Jewish and being different and growing up in a place where there weren't a lot of Jewish people. Um, and so I started really digging into what does generational trauma look like? What does internalized racism and internalized anti-Semitism manifest in relationships and in how you show up in this world? And this past year for me has been really dedicated to understanding myself better in this way and then also helping people from minority groups to understand how this internalized like self-hate might be coming up in their relationships and their mental health and their self-esteem and really helping them break free of that. Yes, it's, it's so many layers, isn't it? Like everything how you how you dress or what you might be eating or not eating what you drink and you don't drink or what you do on saturday or on sunday so people are saying oh why don't you do this why don't you do that and you have to explain over and over and i have to say in a different way i kind of sympathize a lot because you know i moved from sardinia which is her own culture all the way to milan where all my par parents relatives were uh, you know, my cousins and everything. And half of my family, they grew up in Brazil. My mom grew up in Brazil. So we had all this culture mess in the family. And, and one of my aunties, she's from Brazil. And when she came to Italy, she was like, wow, this is so different. She took a few years and she, you know, she, she felt all right. But she's like, I'm Brazilian. And I'm like, oh, wow, you're Brazilian. But depending on which culture, if you say I'm Albanian, this is not going to be very nice. <laughs> or I'm African. So there are ways we perceive culture differently. And we, we might make other people feel differently because they are not like us because the human mind does that doesn't it it's like mm -hmm. if you are different you must be wrong <laughs> just something you have to be like me if you don't fit the little frame a little box where i put you you you, you know and um that was really amplified when i am um, i was in, in the missionary training center in provo utah so i was an italian in provo everything was different oh, you're italian do italians have shoes I'm like, we have the biggest exporters of fashion shoes in the world. Yes, we have shoes. I thought Italians walk on bare feet. I mean, really? What is that? You know, the ignorance about my country. And then I moved to the UK and another huge change because the UK has their own ideas about Italy. So it keeps changing. And now <coughs> I'm in the United States, <laughs> two months now, two and a half months. And back again, oh, you're from Italy. Oh, I love your accent. But it can go down to making you feel sometimes, is it that different that people don't understand me or something? So there could be all sorts of comments. Luckily with me, everyone has been so good. I really have no complaints. But we can do all this talking internally. 
so that everyone is nice, but we think, well, maybe I shouldn't wear that type of clothes. Or I think if you're Indian from India and you got this wonderful sari and you show up and you're the only person wearing that, everyone is in jeans, you're going to stand out. You know, people, you know, and then you're going to be proud of it or not proud. And so what is the difference between feeling proud of your culture, although you are completely blended in the, in the community and feeling like you have to hide it? Where, where is the switch? What did you have to do to change that? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a few aspects that need to be considered. I think as a child or as a teenager, you have a bigger need in order to blend in and fit in. A big need, mm -hmm. right, for teens especially is belonging, right? Like they want their friends to accept them. They want to fit in. And so I think it depends on like what age or which developmental milestone you're in when you are someone that comes into a place where no one is like you, right? And the messaging that you get like, oh, my family eats different food than all my friends or my family dresses different or has a different accent, right? And for depending on where you're at in your own personal development, right? It can manifest differently. Obviously, even for adults, it can be hard, right? If you come from a different culture, you have an accent or, you know, you move to a place where there's not a lot of people that look like you or understand your mm. background and where you're coming from and you start job you might have some anxiety around that but at that point when you're an adult you usually have a stronger sense of self right you've lived more life you've been able to you know your brains developed you've had more experiences usually by the time you're an adult you have a little bit more confidence and grounding in who you are and a little bit more appreciation for where you come from and your differences but for kids and for teenagers right it's very different. They're still figuring out who am I? How do I belong in this world? Who I do, how do I relate to the people around me, right? And they can be very embarrassed of being different because all they want is to fit in and be accepted. And so I do think it depends where you're at in your own personal journey of like personal growth and development and life stage of how this shows up in a lot of ways. Um, but what I do think in order to overcome it, right, is to, from an early age, if you are someone that is an immigrant or from a different racial background or from a different religion in a place where there's people that are different from you, I think it's very important to have those conversations with radical honesty and radical openness in your family, right? So if you have children or you have teenagers and you move to a place where other people don't look like them, it's important to hold space and talk about what is your experience at school? Like, what are what feelings come up for you? Like, do you feel like your culture is accepted by the people around you or not, right? And I think that responsibility lies on the adults in the family, right? To hold space for the child or the adolescent's experience and to empathize with like, it's hard being a teenager, it's hard being a kid, it's hard being in a place where you look and are different than the people around you. And to validate that while also instilling like a pride and understanding of like your cultural history and how there are places in the world where you do belong and people do look like you. And that's something that you should be proud of, right? Not ashamed of. Right, so it's kind of that balance of both. And what I have seen a lot, both as someone who's first gen and has immigrant parents, and also as a therapist, is there is a problem that happens when the parents themselves also have internalized racism, right? So they have their own guilt or their own shame around being different, right? So they aren't able to have those conversations and they aren't able to hold that space in order to help their children process this experience, right? Because they themselves are uncomfortable with the differences that they have from the people around them. And so this is why it's so important to become aware of like, do I have internalized racism towards myself as an adult, right? So. I now see after October 7th that I did have internalized anti-Semitism 
and that if I had moved to a place where there weren't a lot of Jewish people, I probably wouldn't be able to have these types of conversations because I would be kind of dis disowning and moving away from my own discomfort around this topic, right? And the only way to really understand it is to give it space and give it empathy and to hold space for that pain and the rejection and the trauma and the layers of historical discrimination that people from marginalized groups have experienced, right? And to allow yourself to grieve, not just for yourself, but to grieve for your ancestors and to grieve for your parents and your grandparents and historical um, people in your family lineage that have gone through discrimination and trauma. I love that. Walk with a story, you know, when, when you were talking about this and, um, and I was just thinking about my own ancestry, uh, I realized many, many years ago, way before I joined the LDS church, so my family was a Catholic, and my mom had this really big prompting of looking up her family history and see who's in my family from this side and that side. So she spent an inordinate amount of time looking up where my family came from. And she found a lot more info from my father's side. Yeah. And so as my mom was doing this research, she found out that um, the brother of a grandfather of my dad had emigrated to Argentina in the 1900s. And so they went, oh, they say, in your family. So they went in, in Old Side, which is a small town in, in, in Sardinia, where my dad was from, and we did some research. And, and somebody said, oh, yeah, because they know the genealogy of everyone. Yeah, these people went to, uh, to Argentina so many years ago. Here's the names. So my mom did all this research, and she found out we have over 100 living Argentinian <laughs> relatives, all from Old Side, this tiny town. And um, so they got in touch. They found out where they are. Um, they went to see them in Argentina and um, lo and behold, these people, so basically a century after emigrating, they had all the Sardinian recipes, the new Sardinian language, <laughs> they had the costumes, they had all the food and the habits and it was like, these are just the Sardinian people on holiday here, you know, <laughs> it's just mad. And uh, it was so good for my parents to see that they they kept the heritage, kept the language, kept so much stuff, although Spanish was their first language, you know, Argentina. And when they came around, they went to Sardinia, also they came to Tuscany to see us. It was just as if we were always been, you know, we've, we've always been in touch. It was just your blood is calling, but they were completely integrated in the Argentinian society. And yet they knew exactly how to cook seadas and cipulas, all the stuff you buy in Sardinia. It was amazing. They knew the songs. I think some have a uh, harmonium, physharmonic in Italian. It was incredible. And so I think these are very strong um, connections. And even so, we can make that connection with ourselves, with our ancestry, because very important, in my opinion, the ancestors are not very far. They are there. We can see them, but they're still there. And energetically, they want us to be happy and to love who we are. Because if you, if you don't love yourself, you're going to become ill. You're just not going to be yes. well, aren't you? Because you, you love part of yourself and these are in yourself the memories of these people. So energetically speaking, we need that love and, and that acceptance because when we hate, things are not going to well. So I'm really thankful that you brought this, you know, it's a very deep, heart, heartbreaking thing to hear how much pain there is when we reject who we are and where we come from. Because there's nothing wrong you've been from another country compared to somebody else. Who cares? What's the problem? Yeah. At the end of the day, we're all just people. And I always say, whenever, when we all die, you can't tell which skeleton was Jewish or which skeleton was Palestinian or which skeleton was black or white, right? We are all just skeletons at the end of the day. 100%. And I think like there's, there's a lot of like um, ego in focusing on our differences instead of our similarities, which is, in my opinion, leaning into our soul. And I try really hard to lean into soul more than ego. And I hope that we move towards a world where people embrace their culture, embrace their race, embrace their religion and celebrate it. And that we can, you know, be curious and empathetic and loving towards each other and ourselves. Right. But you're right. If you don't love yourself, you can't, you can't choose the right people. You can't find that type of love because everything starts from within you first. Yeah. 
love yourself so you can love others. You know, for, for the Christians, is love your neighbor as you love mm-hmm. thyself. And how are you going to love yourself if you think your own culture is wrong, you don't even speak the language in the house, and you have to eat only like the other people? Why? It's just food, you know. So just enjoy and make festivals instead of uh, wars to rejoice over differences, which this is why people drive and fly to visit the rest of the world to see all the beauties. It's not all just in America or just in Africa or just in Oceania. We have so much bounty. Why don't we all just enjoy and, and see if it, why does it have to be all the same? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> just beyond me that we have to look at everyone being a clone. Why don't just, just go to Barbie and make all these Barbie factories and they're all the same? <laughs> Yeah, you know it's the difference they make life so so good. So I think you gave us loads and lots of useful tips. But if people want to come and see you, where can they find you to um, vent with all the problems and see maybe some therapy, maybe some help? Where can we find you? Yeah, so I actually don't see clients anymore. I started a company called Meridian Counseling, and we have 132 therapists throughout California and throughout Utah. So. We offer telehealth and in-person services, and we have therapists from all cultural and religious backgrounds. And we take all insurance plans, including Medi-Cal, up to private pay. So we have a wide range of providers and we have a wide range of clients that we service from all different backgrounds and social economic statuses. And it's something that I'm really proud of is I built a company that helps a wide range of people um and brings them together with with healers right with therapists that can really help them unpack things they're going through so um, my company is called meridian counseling right now we're in california and utah but we are expanding um, to other states hopefully in the next few years and um, they can find us at meridian-counseling.com and then my own um, instagram is sanj um, underscore kushner and I talk a lot on my own account about first gen problems and generational trauma and narcissistic abuse, because those are things I'm passionate about. So if you want to reach out to me directly, you can reach out through social media or you can check out Meridian Counseling and find a therapist there um, that takes your insurance. That's brilliant. We're going to put all the links uh, wherever you're listening, you know, podcast or YouTube will be all the links for you guys. You can go and, and see Sandra Kushner. So thank you so much for coming to the show. It's been such a pleasure and so much I learned today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a wonderful conversation. Be sure you come back. There will be some more ta- some more topics. And remember NPD and whatever else you told me. <laughs> in the- so she will be back, guys. So thank you everyone for being here. And if you have any questions, make sure that you contact both of us for whatever you want to know. And we'll be happy to help you. And of course, click, share, write, review, subscribe. You know what to do. It's always the same thing. So see you all next week. Bye.